If you got a Bible, let's grab them, and uh, we're going to go back to the book of James today. Back to the book of James. If you got your uh, under pressure book, book of James journal, page sixty nine today, you can you can take notes. And we are in part seven of Under Pressure. Have y'all enjoyed this series so far? Has it been good? Come on online, put an emoji chat right there. I love it. You know what it means today is we're in part seven. Uh, that next Sunday is the finale. Uh, we're going to land the plane. We're going to close out our fall study. Uh, so don't miss it. You're going to want to be here. Bring somebody with you as we got some, I think, some really great things as James really closes out his book. But if you are a first-time guest, the reason why we're calling the teaching series Under Pressure is because nobody knew more than the first century church what it was like to experience pressure. We've already discovered that James, the brother of Jesus, was the first pastor of the Jerusalem church, which is where the church was birthed, if you will. And immediately they were faced, these new believers, with pressure on every side. The Romans wanted this to stop. The religious leaders wanted this to stop. I'm talking they were fearing, they were dying, they were getting arrested. And so in order to sort of save this movement, they began to scatter and disperse. They weren't able to gather like we are today physically because the persecution was so severe. So Pastor James writes this letter to a scattered, broken, under-pressured church. And I know you and I will probably never experience that kind of persecution in our life, but we are certainly not void of pressure. I mean, I bet right now, if I was to give you the mic, you could tell me about the pressing, the weight that you feel with whatever it is that you're going through. And so what James has already showed us is that pressure is not a bad thing. Matter of fact, pressure is a revealer. We, we've said when it comes to your faith in Jesus, it really authenticates what you believe. Like, I don't care what you believe when everything's good and up and to the right. I want to know what are you going to do with Jesus when you're suffering, when you're going through pain, and when things aren't working out your way. That often, it's in the pressure moments that God begins to develop us and to grow us, completeness, lacking nothing. And today, as we continue this journey, um, I'm excited about today, because this is one of these like all play messages Well, you know, some of you come to church and you're hearing this and you're like, you're thinking of your spouse sitting next to you like, oh, this is for them. Come on, you know, like you better listen up. Uh, This is for all of us because this is a message about conflict, about fighting, about selfishness. Go ahead, just tell the person that you came with, this is for you. Go ahead, come on. That's right, tell them this is for you. Because what what we've experienced is that the distance that the first century church has been experiencing is creating problems. The distance is, well, the external conflict is now creating internal conflict with inside of the church. And James is going to speak into this today. So James chapter 4, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read from Eugene Peterson's message version. It's not a translation. It, it just reads more like a story. So here's what James writes. Everyone take a deep breath. We're going to read like, I don't know, maybe 13 verses. It says this. James says, where do you think all these appealing wars and quarrels come from? Do you think they, they just happen? He says, think again. They come about because you want your own way and you fight for it deep down inside yourself. You lust for what you cannot have and are willing to kill to get it. You want what isn't yours and you'll risk violence to get your hands on it. This is a messed up church, y'all. I'm just saying. He says, verse uh, two, you wouldn't think of just asking God for it, would you? And why not? Because you know that you'd be asking for what you have no right to. You're, You're a spoiled children, each wanting your own way. You're cheating on God. If all you want is your own way, flirting with the world every chance you get, you end up enemies of God in his way. And do you suppose God doesn't care? The proverb has it that he's fiercely jealous lover. And what he gives in love is far better than anything that you'll ever find. It's common knowledge that God goes against the willful proud and he gives grace to the willing humble. So so because of that, let God work his will in you. Yell aloud no to the devil and watch him make himself scarce. Say a quiet yes to God and he'll be there in no time. Quit dabbling in sin. Purify your inner life. Quit playing the field. Hit bottom and cry your eyes out. The fun and games are over. Get serious, really serious. Get down on your knees before the master. It's the only way that you'll get on your feet. All right, are y'all excited today? Are you nervous? Okay, I'm going to pray one more time and we're going to jump into this today. If you're taking notes, I want to speak to you from this thought right here. You ready? The danger of distance. The danger of distance. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that it magnifies. It magnifies, well, the areas of our life where we haven't quite arrived yet. 
And so, Lord, it takes an open heart to receive this word today. And God, I pray wherever we're watching from, whatever we came in, Lord, that we just humble ourselves and we say, all right, Lord, whatever you want, I have your way with me. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. I'm curious, um, have you ever been, um, how many of you have ever been in a long distance relationship? You ever been in one long distance, long distance? Come on online, you participate. All right. How many of you, anybody currently in a long distance? Currently? Okay. Got a few people. How many of you are in a relationship? It's not long distance, but you kind of wish it was. <laughs> You're like, babe. Okay. No fighting in church. You're like, ah, I love you. I just need to miss you for a little bit. Um, yeah, so my wife and I, we married 15 years, but when we first started off, there were two summers before we got married where we had to figure out this relationship thing through distance. Now, distance today, if you're in a long distance relationship, it's still difficult. I mean, don't, don't hear me incorrectly here, but it's better, right? Because you can FaceTime, you can send videos, take pictures, literally wherever there's internet around the world, you can at least physically see each other and connect. But teenagers, especially teenagers, listen, there was actually a day, are you ready for this? When the internet didn't exist. I know. You're like, how did you survive? How did you make, it was, bar it was seriously, it was barbaric, all right? If you wanted to make a phone call, you actually had to go to this machine attached to your parents' wall that was connected to a cord. And then you had to call somebody. If you wanted to like, know if somebody was home, you would actually go to their house and knock on their door. Now today, y'all, like, if somebody knocks on my door, my first thought is, what's wrong with you? You couldn't call me, message me, DM me, Facebook me. I mean, like, you have the gall, the audacity to come to my, you must want something from me. Am I the only one that thinks this? It's like, it's weird now. But there was a day, there was a day where distance was really difficult. So the way that you would stay connected, especially if it was a long distance relationship and you want to make a phone call, is you had to purchase one of these. How many of y'all remember this? Come on. We got an old church, don't we? Yeah, these are calling cards, phone cards. So what you would have to do is you would spend like 50 bucks and you'd get like 60 minutes on a prepaid calling card. You don't even know what long distance is anymore because there's no such thing. But in the day, if you were calling somebody outside of your area code, that's a long distance call. So when you're spending 50 bucks for 60 minutes, every single minute mattered. And I quickly learned that first summer that Emily and I had to spend apart that I'm not good at distance. I'm not, like I'm not really good on the phone. I'm not really good at articulating the emotions of my day and running through the play by play. And, and so you have this interesting dynamic because like you wanna talk to the girl, the guy that you're dating, but you don't really know what to say, but you don't wanna waste your minutes. So you end up just hearing them breathe on the phone you know, yeah, you, this, is, this is young love. This is young love right here. And so that first summer, we didn't do well, and it created a lot of danger. We experienced the distance that it created in our own relationship. So the next summer, as we get ready for the second part of our long-distance relationship, we were determined that we got to close the gap. I mean, even if we can't be together physically, we can still feel connected. So both of us made, you might be wondering what this is, we both made each other these boxes, and um, don't worry, corny meter, it's gonna go really high here for a second, so just bear with me. Um, we made these boxes and we put inside of the box a little phrase uh, inside saying or word of encouragement, one for every day that we were apart. And everybody said, oh, and the ladies, like, come on, it's Hallmark Christmas, right? Like, it's already on. And so Emily, um, em this is actually Emily's original box. Do y'all wanna hear one? Do you wanna hear one? I don't have to read it. You, you wanna hear it? All right, all right, I'll read one here. Here's one right here. She, uh, this was one of the days. Um, I, I, I love you because was like the theme. I loved our walks in the woods where we would talk about what it meant to keep Jesus at the center of our relationship. Here's another one. Um, the surprise visit to the airport and how wonderful it, it was to see you. All right, I'll give you one more so you can stop throwing up in your mouth. <laughs> I loved our first dance experience, me being too afraid to dip. That's, you can figure that out. Y'all, your girl had game. Emily has some game, all right? She pursued me hard, asked me to marry her three times. I finally gave up. And I said, y'all know that's not true. <laughs> right, but the whole point of this, and I know it's cheesy and maybe romantic and maybe a little bit of both, but the point was we, just, we gotta figure out a way to close the distance because I realized that distance can be, can be dangerous. Matter of fact, this is exactly what James is stepping into. Well, this physical distance, the church is not able to see one another is causing a lot of damage. And here's the big theme for James, and I think you're gonna pick this up for your life if you're taking notes. It's that the further the distance, the greater the miss. Distance will make you miss. 
misinterpret, misunderstand, misappreciate, distance makes you miss. It's like when you're in elementary school and you played that game telephone. Remember that? Where like you'd get down here with one kid and you're like, all right, here's the message that you gotta send all the way down the line. I'm carving pumpkins for Halloween. And then you're all the way down here. And then finally gets to the last kid. You're like, what do you say? I'm going to punch a chicken in the wing. <laughs> and you're like, no, you, you missed it. Why? The distance caused you to miss. Now, that's really lighthearted when it's a game, but it can be very detrimental when it's a relationship. And I just wonder today how many of you are here sitting next to your spouse, but you feel distant. Nobody knows but you that you haven't slept in the same bedroom in over two months. I wonder how many single adults are in here today and you just feel lonely and there's a, a distance from you and the next intimate relationship. I wonder how many parents right now you're raising a child that you just feel distant from, like you can't connect with them and what's happening, the distance is causing you to miss. And I know that the old phrase says that absence makes the heart grow fonder, but can I propose to you today that I would also say that distance makes the heart grow harder. Distance makes you, makes you miss. And so James steps into this, well, this church that is falling apart right in front of him. His brother Jesus just went through everything he did, truly the son of God, and it's unraveling. And James is trying to do whatever he can in his pastoral abilities to sort of close the distance. And so what I wanna do today is I wanna walk back through what James just taught us, and I wanna show you today the danger of distance and what it can cause in your relationships and even in your relationship with God. So let's unpack this today. Look at verse one back in James chapter four. James says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? This is the NIV version. He says, they don't, they don't come from, uh, or don't they come from your desires and battle within you? <laughs> you desire, but you do not have, so you kill. And don't think literal kill. Think what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, where if you, if you, if you hate somebody, you murder them in your heart. Like you can murder without physically doing it. That's what he's saying. So you kill, you covet, but you can't get what you want. So you quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So James is gonna walk us through a couple different phases of what distance, the danger of distance. And the first thing that distance creates, I want you to write this down, is conflict. It's con and conflict's all about disagreement. Now this is where we can all get on the same page because nobody in this room is void of conflict. I mean, wherever there are relationships, whoo, passion, opinion, disagreement, there will be conflict. But conflict, I hope you know this, it's not, it's not a bad thing. I would actually say that conflict can be the very thing that takes your relationship past certain barriers. So conflict isn't bad, it's how you handle it, it's what you do with it. But what's interesting to me about what James is talking about is he's not talking about external conflict, he's talking about internal conflict. In other words, the real fight is not between you and them. The real battle is between you and you. It's the battle on the inside of me. He's talking about the, the fight between your flesh and your spirit. If you're new to the Bible, there's this New Testament theme that the Apostle Paul writes kind of all throughout his letters, this idea of my new nature in Christ. The moment you gave your life to Jesus, God didn't renovate you. It wasn't in a home extreme makeover. He made you a new creation. You are now a child of God. So there's this battle between who God says I am and my flesh. As long as I live in the body, I'm always gonna be bent towards selfishness and my desires, quick pleasure, quick comfort. And therein lies where conflict lives. It is all about me, James says. I wanna, I wanna get what I want, do what I want. And if I don't get what I want, then you and I got issues. But you're not really the problem. I'm the problem. I'm just taking it out on you. Am I preaching the truth? Come on, somebody wave at me. I know this is convicting, right? That, that's what he's talking about here. I, you're not the issue. It's really, it's really me. And so James begins to unpack this as the church begins uh, to fight and get them to see that the battle is on the inside. And I want to help you out today because you don't have marriage problems. You, you don't have kid problems. You don't have finance. You don't even have a boss problem. You have you problems that are coming out in ways that are taking it out on other people. Now, I'm not saying that you don't experience conflict and pain and other people don't hurt you. But what I am saying is that you get to guard your heart. You get to control your response. The Bible says that above all else, guard your, you're responsible for guarding your own heart. And this is very sobering, but every single conflict that I've ever been in had one common denominator. Me, me. 
And so James is stepping into these fights like Dr. Phil on a family feud, and he's trying to hold these church, this church back and together. And he's basically like, guys, what are you doing? You're, you're like going after each other, but the real battle isn't with them. The real battle is with you. It's a disagreement between your flesh and your, and your spirit. And if you can't solve the inner conflict, the gap will only continue to grow. And did you notice that James doesn't give us specifics on what the church is fighting over? I think it's intentional. I think it's intentional because it doesn't matter. Like there's always gonna be a new day. And whenever there's a new day, there's gonna be a new relationship, a new president, a new mandate, a new social media post, something else that you disagree with. Conflict, inner conflict is a way of life and you've gotta learn how to operate out of the spirit. And so this distance, it's, well, it's causing them to fight and it's bringing out, honestly, the disagreement within them, within us. Look at the next verse, verse two. He says, so here's the next phase. You covet, but you can't get what you want. And so you quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you don't receive because you ask God with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So, Paul, so James is like, all right, this is dangerous. This distance, it's causing conflict, which is disagreement. Here's the second phase. Now we're straight up coveting. Now, now you're, co that's desire. Do, do you see this in your own life? That when you don't win this internal battle between your spirit and your flesh, and you let the flesh begin to win, it always leads to covenant. And so now you can't be grateful for what you do have because you're so focused on what you don't have. And so now all you're consumed with is why God isn't showing up in your life and why things aren't working out in your life and how you want that and I should have that and I should deserve this. This is, this is the danger right here. And it's really easy even in our relationship with Jesus to think that I've done all these things, God, you owe me. But can I help you out? God doesn't owe you anything. God doesn't owe you a good marriage. God doesn't owe you a family. God doesn't owe you wealth. God doesn't owe you a, a job. God doesn't owe us. God doesn't owe us anything. And it's really powerful and refreshing whenever you meet somebody who understands what the grace of God has done in their life. You ever met somebody who understands what the grace of God has done for them and how what the grace of God has done for them, they're able to spot the goodness of God in their life. And when you begin to spot the goodness of God in your life, it, it creates gladness and gladness produces gratitude. It's a beautiful cycle. God's grace, I spot his goodness, that goodness creates gladness, and now that I'm grateful. And when we take our eyes off of spotting what God is doing in our life, it's really easy to get entitled. And honestly, this is where a lot of people bail on Jesus. Because somewhere along the way, God didn't give you what you wanted. Or even worse, God didn't give you what you thought your behavior had earned. This is why church moralism doesn't work. We gotta stop preaching moralism as moralism is the savior that basically the concept is, well, if I'm just a good person and if I do enough good things and I read my Bible and I pray and then, oh, here's the list. Look at me, how religious I am. All the things on the list that I don't do. So I, I don't dance. I don't shoot tobacco. I don't go see R-rated movies unless they're about Jesus. I I don't drink, I don't wear Budweiser t-shirts, unless it's Dale, salute number three. Like I don't look at, <laughs> God, look at me. I mean, my religious vigor, it's not about what I do, it's about what I, what I can withstand from. And then there's these moments where you crash because you've done all these things and you still suffer and you still get cancer and you still hurt and the marriage still ends. And you wonder, God, I did everything for you. You're indebted to owe me, but God doesn't owe us anything. Can I tell you why? God can't be in your debt because he's already given us the greatest gift of Jesus. He's already freed us from sin. He's already given you life and purpose on this earth and eternity in heaven with God one day. I mean, church, if God doesn't bless me with one more thing, come on, he's already done enough. He's already done enough. I don't know about you. He's already done enough in my life. If you don't give me one more thing, Lord, you've already done enough. I mean, when did Jesus stop becoming enough? And so James is backing up for a minute. And he's like, All, when you lose sight of the ability to spot God's goodness, you lose your gladness. When you lose your joy and your gladness, you miss the gratitude. This is a red flag. Now coveting, your desires are starting to work itself out. 
And you'll do whatever it takes. Come on, I know me. I'll do whatever it takes to get what I want. Danger. <laughs> There's so much distance. It's causing danger. And then the third step, and this is always where it leads to, is straight up compromise. And that's the decision. Let's look at verse four. He uses a word. He says, you adulterous people, don't you know? Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses, everyone say chooses. Choose. Say it's my choice. <laughs> anyone who chooses to be, um, to be friends of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think that scripture says without reason that he's jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? So it starts off as this internal battle, my flesh, my spirit. Uh, I've, allowed it, I've allowed it to grow and now I'm coveting. I, I, I don't have this, this longing for stuff that you don't have. You're missing God's goodness in your life, folks, on what you don't have. You might think that God even owes you, but he doesn't really owe you anything. And now here comes the, con it's a full-blown decision to compromise. What James is saying is that church, you look just like the world. And when he says world, he's talking about the value system of the dominant culture. But you're not created to blend in, follower of Jesus. You're created to stand out. But you're so consumed about blending in. Your marriages look the same. The divorce rate's the same. You parent the same like everybody else. You're financially in debt like everybody else. You worry. You're addicted. Every single thing. Why in the world would people want to know Jesus when they're not even attracted to your life? Y'all aren't ready for this today. I'm telling you, why, why, right? Because they look at you and we just look like everybody else does. And he says, this is, this is actually a hindrance to the gospel. You've gotten too close. I, I lived um, in Ohio most of my life and I learned when I moved to the South, did I get a woo? Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're flexing the shoes. You see the bangles, you see how they're doing today. I wasn't gonna say it, but you noticed. Come on, you noticed. But I lit, when I moved to the, uh, the South like 20 years ago, I realized something. Um, there, there is a second language in the South called Southern slang. Are y'all familiar with this? How many Northerners do we got? How many transplants? Okay, I'm gonna help you out here, okay? There is a second language that takes place in these parts called Southern slang. Um, and I realized basically depending on what part of the South you're in, of course it, it differentiates. One of the main tactics it seems like from Southerners is they'll take a sentence that consists of like five words and they'll shrink it down to two. Right? Am I right? Or they'll take a word and they'll accent certain vowels and consonant sounds. So I'm going to see how good you are so far since a lot of Northerners are here today, transplants. How good are you at speaking Southern? Here's the first word right here. Uh, tar. Tar. What's it? Tar heels. It could be that. It could be that. I'll use it in a sentence, all right? Man, I just got a nail on my tar. It's a, it's a tire. It's a tire, yeah. And by the way, if, if you need multiple tires, it's not, it's not tires with an S. It's tars with a Z. Just in case you're wondering, you go into, you know, discount tire, is, I need some tars. Uh, here's another one, Fidna. Fidna. Huh? That's it, yeah. Here's what it means. I'm about, I'm fitting to come down these steps, boy, and hurt you if you don't do your homework, right, moms? That's what it is. I'm about to, I'm fitting to. Isn't that amazing? It's like a four word sentence compressed into this phrase. Um, here's another one uh, buggy. Go get a buggy. Huh? Shopping cart. I remember the first time my wife said, Nate, go get a buggy. I'm like, what are you? I literally did not know what she was talking about. So there's this language, this subculture in the South called Southern slang. Now, I have an advantage. I have a great advantage. I married a Southerner. And Emily, honestly, this is true. I'm not even messing around. She will serve as my translator <laughs> a lot of times. And this came in handy a couple weeks ago. Her and I went up to the mountains and up to the Blowing Rock area, just the two of us. And we stopped um, right before Hickory, right? So we're in like the country, right? And we pulled off the exit and we went to a cookout fast food restaurant. So when we pull into the cookout, I noticed that they had a drive through option, but they weren't doing indoor seating, but they had a window that you could go up to and order your food. So it's a beautiful day. And I'm like, why don't we just, we're not in a hurry. Let's just go up to the window and order our food. So we go up to the window and I'm standing in line and behind me comes this older gentleman, extremely nice, humble guy. But I'm telling you, he was country personified in a body. I mean, he had the big old beard, the cut up American flag hat, the overall bibs with the cut off shirt underneath it. And so we start this conversation and I had told him that we're from South Carolina. And I said, in South Carolina, you can go indoors and eat. 
like all of the indoor dining is open. In which he replied to me, well, I reckon up in these parts, all we got are windows and drive throughs <laughs> Windows and drive throughs See, some of you already know what he just said, didn't you? You're like, oh yeah, what's the problem with that? No, exactly what he said. What I heard him say were all we have around here, I got the first part, were Wendy's and drive throughs <laughs> In which I replied, that's not too bad. I love Wendy's. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. You can ask him. He looked at me like, boy, what you talking about? And I looked at him like, what you talking about? I mean, it's just like, are we, having the, are we speaking the same language here? And so Emily pulls me aside and she's like, oh, bless your heart. <laughs> Which you know what that means. That means you're an idiot. That's code. <laughs> he did not say Wendy's and drive throughs He said windows and drive throughs All we have up here are windows and drive throughs I'm like, how did you get windows from Winders? I just, <laughs> and Emily's like, because I grew up with it. I grew up around it. I was, I was close to it. Have you ever noticed that when you get close to something, you can look like it, talk like it, act like it, think like it, believe like it, behave like it? James is saying, church, that's what you're doing with the world. You're getting way too close where now you're just looking like it, acting like it, thinking like it, speaking like it. But I want you to know, child of God, that you were created to be a part of a different culture, the kingdom of heaven, bringing heaven down to earth. We don't speak like that anymore. We don't hold on to grudges like that anymore. We don't treat people like that anymore because you're a son of God, a daughter of God who's been set free by the blood of Jesus. Come on, aren't you grateful for that? You're not bound to that lifestyle. When you have tasted and seen the goodness of God, Ooh, you realize there's nothing, there's nothing I could go back to. No matter what comes, God, you are, you are too good. And I wonder, church, even though God is so good, have we gotten too close? Have we gotten too close? This is where compromise begins to set in. And maybe you're thinking through your life right now. And you're thinking, oh man, this is what a great sermon today on this Halloween. I mean, I am, I'm selfish. I have internal battles. I get what I want. I'll deceive and manipulate people to get it. It's really because I'm coveting and I really don't have what I want. And I'm not able to spot the goodness of God in my life. And now I'm fully compromised. I look like just the world. And my life isn't a witness it's actually to turn to what God has wanted to do in my life. <laughs> Does that sum it up, pastor? Is that, listen, the goal isn't guilt. James's goal is not guilt. Now, if you feel that, don't, don't feel guilt, feel conviction. Because verse six, don't sleep on verse six. This is where it all comes together. He says, but he gives us more grace. I got good news for somebody today that even in your selfishness, there's more grace. Even in your sin, there's more grace. Even in your addiction, there's more grace because there is no sin that is greater than the power of the cross. I feel like preaching this right here. I don't care what you've done, where you've been, how far from God that you might feel. There is no sin in your life that is greater than what the power of Jesus has done on that cross. It's why Romans 6, 23 says that where sin abides, grace increases all the more. You can't out sin Jesus. Isn't that good? You should respond like it's good. Like, yeah. Yeah. But he gives more grace. Now, here's the thing. We've had two millenniums to work out the doctrine of grace. We've had two millenniums to work out theology of sanctification and justification and what the power of the cross really did and new identity. James's original church, he's writing this in real time. This is like 20, 30, some scholars maybe will push it to 40 years after the resurrection. So what they're accustomed to, this is so foreign to them, by the way, what the Israelites, the nation of Israel so used to was the old covenant. Can I teach Old Testament for a minute? Because you're gonna, you got to understand it to appreciate. So they're used to old covenant. What, what, what does covenant mean? It means a promise, a, a commitment between God and humanity. Your Old Testament part of your Bible. Think Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments were established between God and Israel. But the Ten Commandments, the law, required perfection. Now you might think, man, what a mean God. That's, that, that's just cruel. Why would God ever do that? Well, it served a purpose. Moses delivers the nation of Israel out of Egyptian slavery for 400 years. So they didn't know how to think free. They didn't know how to live free. For 400 years, generations, everybody told them what to do and when to do it. So God knows, okay, if they're gonna be my people, I have to establish a law that if they will abide in these 10 things, just think only 10, it will lead to life. But the problem with the law is that God was distant. 
God could not be in the presence of humanity because we're sinful. This is pre-Jesus. And so God was like up here and we're down here. So think about it like this ladder. I know some of you are like, are you going to get to the ladder? There's a big ladder on stage. But this to me is a great image of what the old covenant would have been like. So God is up high. I am down low. And the only way that I can close the distance between me and God is up to my behavior. But it wasn't about just like keeping, keeping the Ten Commandments for, you know, a couple months and then I'm good. It required perfection all the time. But we could never do this. But we would try. The Israelites would try. I'd say, okay, God, I'm coming up, Lord. This is my year. The ball drops. And, you know, there's uh, Dick Van Dyke or whoever. And we're like, okay, it's my new year, new me. And, Lord, I'm coming up to you. And so we start to climb to God with our morality and our behavior. And we get to the first one. And it says, uh, don't bow down before any other gods. You're like, ah, oh, crap, I bowed down to a golden calf. Ah, let, me, let me walk around the tent for a little bit. Let me get an animal. Let me offer it up for a sacrifice. Okay, God, I'm good now. I'm, I'm going I'm to do better. I'm going to try harder. Don't bow down to any other God. Okay, I'm good. Uh, no false witnesses before me. Thou shalt not steal. Ah, dang it. I stole grain from my neighbor's farm, but he's wasteful. I mean, it was justifiable. I mean, come on. Let's, okay, let me get an animal. Let me offer it up for sacrifice. Okay, Lord, it's me again. I promise I'm going to do better. All right, don't bow down to calves and don't have other gods and don't steal and honor your mom and dad. Okay, I'm good, mom and dad. Thou shalt not... Thou shalt not covet. Ah, my neighbor came home with a brand new horse and chariot. You know, the one with the 20-inch rims on it. And I got this piece of crap over here. And All right, let me off. I was jealous for it. I offered the sacrifice, right? And this is, this is what they did. This is Old Covenant. Up the ladder of religion, ah, down the ladder of religion. A better, bigger promise, Lord. I'm going I'm to, and then down the ladder again. And it was up and it was down. And I wonder today, how many of us, even though we are no longer bound by an old covenant, still try to relate to God like this? Like God is up here and I'm way down here. And the only way that I can get to God is if I show him that I'm worthy of his death on the cross. As we come into church settings like this, we say, okay, they're doing the book of James. I'm gonna go to church four Sundays out of, three, two Sundays out of the month. I'm going to read the Bible. Oh my, this is exactly what I needed. They printed the book of James Bibles for me. It's practically in my mouth and I'm going to read every day and I hit the snooze button and I feel like I'm not worthy and I feel like the distance continues to grow. Can I ask you a question? How's this working out for you? Are you tired? Are you exhausted? Do you feel more condemned, more guilt, more shame? You want to know Why? Because the good news of the gospel is that it's not about you coming up to Jesus, but rather God coming down to you. This is the grace of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Love came down and rescued us. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word dwelt among us that we no longer have to keep climbing for God has already come down. Just when you thought the distance between you and God was so great, God sent us his one and only son and Jesus lived the perfect life that we couldn't live. And when he died on that cross, it was the perfect sacrifice once and for all for the law. And when he resurrected from the grave, he didn't just defeat sin and death, but he closed the gap. And as long as the tomb is empty, the gap has been removed. Come on, somebody give God praise today. There, there is no ladder. You can keep climbing, but God's not up there. God's Christ is in me. So let's stop climbing and let's start resting. And let's start realizing that I've got the power of God inside of me. But he gives us more grace. So, a follower of Jesus, I'm speaking to believers. If you follow Jesus, the great news today is that hopefully it's a reminder that the gap has already been closed. There is no distance. Christ settled that for you. So now we're called to then close the distance of conflict between us and other people. That I'm now called as a follower of Jesus to do everything in my power to take a step towards the conflict of the person. Now I get it. You can't control them and you can't change them, but you know what you can do? You can take a step towards them. And how do we, well, how do, we do this? Well, James doesn't leave us hanging. Here's how you close the distance now with other people because of God closing the distance. 
for us, verse seven. He says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. James is like, you wanna get strong? You, you, wanna, you wanna experience strength in your life? You've gotta draw near to God. In other words, here's what he's saying. You have to stay low so you can stand tall. This is the problem with a lot of us. We're not willing to get low. And so we're out here operating our own strength, kicking walls down, just trying to like defeat stuff in our own behavior and our, and our own devotion. I'm gonna do this, but yet you don't ever get any progress. It's because you won't get low. Can I show you a posture of power? This is right here. I mean, when's the last time you just fell before the Lord on your knees and you submitted yourself to him and you said, God, I can't do this on my own. I've tried. It's left my life more of a wreck. I've pursued what I've wanted. It has got me nothing but more heartache. God, I can't do this. God, I submit to you and your plan. Lord, I need you to show me how to be a better husband to my spouse. Father, I need wisdom to be a mother to these kids. I can't do this. Lord, I can't kick this addiction and this struggle on my own. God, I need you. I, I'm drawing near. To, I get low to draw near so that I get the strength of Christ in me. And then I stand up tall and I face the devil in his eyes and I tell the enemy, not my family. You can't have my kids. You can't have my integrity. You can't have my identity in Christ. I've already been low with God and I can stand in strength with you. I feel like somebody today needs to get their strength back, but it's not gonna become, well, happen like this. You've gotta be willing to get down and get low and say, Father God, I'm broken before you. How do we close the distance? Submit to the Lord, resist the devil, and he will flee. I feel like today as we close, there's, I think there's two gaps we've gotta address. One has already been closed, you just have to receive it. But the other gap is probably right now between you and somebody else. So what are you gonna do to get low, to stand tall? How are, how are you gonna help close that gap? How are you gonna show love and mercy the way Christ has showed love and mercy to you? But maybe you're here today and you've never received the first gap, this free gift of grace of what I've been teaching all morning, of what makes the gospel such good news. It is the only thing that can help you stand. It is, he is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other God but him. And maybe you're realizing for the first time, I want a relationship with that Jesus, not moralism, not church religion, like maybe you were raised in. I want a relationship with this creator, God. If that's you, I'd love to just pray for you with every eye closed, every head bowed. I believe that this is a very significant spiritual moment for some people in the room today. And there's nothing magical about a prayer. It really just indicates what we're believing in our heart. But the Bible says all who confess the Lord Jesus as Savior, that he raised from the dead, will be saved. Paul says that in Romans. We believe something significant happened right here. If you're willing to humble and submit, receive forgiveness and follow Christ. So I'd love to just pray for you. You can just pray this quietly to yourself. Say, Lord, right now, I recognize that the distance has been closed, that you paid the perfect sacrifice that the law required. So Father, I stand in the shadow of that cross and I humbly submit. I believe you are the son of God, died on that cross, and it is only through you that we experience salvation. Today, I give my life to you. Father, I thank you so much for every son, every daughter, every man, every woman who's coming home today. We're done climbing ladders of religion. There's no value. There's no worth. There's nothing up there. You're here. I pray for every single person, Lord, that you've put a relationship on their heart, that they're missing each other because of the distance. God, may we take a step and do whatever we can in our power to reflect what you have done for us. We love you. We pray this in your name.